We are in the midst of a preaching series that I've titled, The Powers That Be. And the theme of these messages is concerning the Christian's relationship with government. That is, with the body politic, uh, the rulers, the powers that be, that we would live as Christians in this physical world where we do not rule, but we are called upon to influence. We are not in charge, but we are to obey the instructions our King has given us uh, while we are here on earth. Each Christian has a dual citizenship. Our first devotion is to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our first citizenship is in heaven. Our second citizenship is to whatever country or nation that we're a part of. And God tells us to obey the powers that be. And the Bible tells us to be good citizens and to live among the people that we live in as peace as much as possible. And so we're going through the Word of God to learn about the relationship that we have with the government, but also the relationship that God has with government. And so this part of the series, uh, we're going to title, Speaking Truth to Power. There are times when the Word of God comes to the government. There are times when the truths of God are to be spoken to the powers that be. And I want you to turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And this is going to be the first message in this part of the series that we're calling Speaking Truth to Power. And we have a graphic. I think that came from a children's book, but it speaks to the point. You see Saul, who the Bible described as head and shoulders above other men. And we have the prophet Samuel. And Samuel is confronting Saul. Now, in this narrative... Uh, we find that this is the very first king of Israel. Before that, God would raise up heroes or judges, champions, and deliver them from their enemies militarily, but there was no king in Israel. Well, there came a time when the people desired a king, and uh, Samuel warned them about the type of king they would get, and they said, well, we want that anyway, and so God gave them exactly what Samuel told them they would get, and they got Saul. Now, Saul started out okay. He started out humble. He started out uh, in in a good way with the Lord. But somewhere along the line, he became self-willed and impulsive, and and he became stiff-necked against God. And then later, he became very antagonistic against the prophet and against the will of God. So what we want to do is look at this scene here where the very first king uh, was rebuked by God's prophet. Now, I want to set the scene because there's some elements of this particular passage of Scripture that we need to understand before we read it. And I want to give these so that we do have that understanding. This was a time in God's plan of the ages where He was working through the world in a certain way. He was working through the world through His chosen covenant people, the nation of Israel, who God had delivered from Egypt after being afflicted for 400 plus years. And God was turning this nation into a warrior kingdom that would influence the nations around them through their faithfulness to Jehovah God and their wonderfully blessed ability to defend themselves against their enemies. God was blessing Israel. And also, there was an element to this we need to understand, or this passage will will not uh, ring true. It will not make sense if we don't understand this. At the same time, God was using the nation of Israel and their military to execute His righteous judgment against wicked nations. So there were times when God would call upon the soldiers of Israel, the armies of Israel, to go out and execute God's punishment, His judgment against wicked nations. And this is one particular case of that. And so we're going to read it and give explanation as we go. There's not a real outline to this. We're going to stay pretty much in uh, 1 Samuel 15 and go through the narrative. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand your word, to apply it to our lives. Lord, to believe it, to believe it in in all of its rightfulness and truthfulness. And Lord, to make application as your spirit directs. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now I want to stop right there and just mention, 
This is God speaking. He's speaking through Samuel, but it's God speaking. No other being, no other person, no other entity can speak for God but God. This is God. And what does he say? He says, uh, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. Now, if we did not understand what was happening here, this seems like a horrific, terrible thing to do. But let's think about it for a while. Let's think about it just for a while, okay? First of all, this was God. So God cannot do that which is wrong. Secondly, this was God's particular covenant people nation who were supposed to listen directly from God. They weren't supposed to do what they thought was right. They weren't supposed to do what made sense to them. They were supposed to follow the direct commandments of God. Also, this was God's prophet Samuel who got his word directly from God, and this was to Saul who was the rightfully anointed king of Israel who was supposed to listen to God through his prophet. Now, Amalek was a wicked, idol-worshiping tribe of people. They lived around uh, the area of uh, Moab there, close to Judea, and they were very wicked. Uh, they sacrificed infants uh, they had terribly uh, profane and lewd religious practices that involved every kind of licentiousness that you can possibly imagine. Uh, they were the perpetual enemies of Israel, uh, hindering them, uh, murdering them, uh, attacking them uh, all through history. Uh, and God said, I'm going to execute judgment upon them. I want them gone. I want them wiped out. Now, today, we would call that genocide. And there's uh, international laws against genocide. But now let's understand something. God can do whatever he will. And if it's his will that a certain group of people that he has, uh, th that he has reached, they have reached the limit of God's patience with them and he takes them out, he will do it. Now some would say, well, that's terrible. Well, may I remind you that uh, a few hundred years uh, before this, God destroyed the entire planet for their wickedness, except eight people. So God, who is God, can take life when He wills, according to His eternal righteous will, and we do not get veto privileges. We do not have the right to challenge Him or say, what do you, are you doing? God will do what He will do. Now, it was God's will that Saul take his armies and wipe out an entire group of wicked people and just remove them from the presence of the earth. That was the instructions. That's what God told him to do. Do not question God. Do not say to God, you're wrong. Now, interestingly enough, there are people who would recoil at this, and they would be in horror of this, and they would say, how dare God commit an act of genocide? These same people would believe that it's entirely fine to rip infants out of their mother's belly in the name of uh, their convenience, uh, slaughter innocent people who have never committed a crime of any kind. They're fine with murder as long as it's them doing it, and they're happy with doing it to the innocent. God cannot commit murder when God takes lives, when God destroys people, He does it because of their wickedness and for reasons that He knows that we don't have the right to question. So God's going to be God. Now, I remind you, He destroyed the entire world with a flood before. What's coming is God's going to destroy this earth with a fire coming up. The armies of the Antichrist will be wiped out, and Jesus, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, is going to take over everything. So this is God being God. And may I make the stretch, and it's not much of a stretch, this is Jesus too. This is Jesus too. Jesus was not in heaven with his arms crossed, shaking his head while God did this. Jesus was with the Father and with the Holy Spirit in total harmony and agreement when Saul got his instructions. So let's put that to rest. Okay, now what happens? Verse 4. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, 
Go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Now just a little bit of historical background on this so we understand what's happening. The Kenites were the relatives of Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. When they came out of Egypt, they went with them. And so they had multiplied through the land and dwelt among them as nomads. Uh, They were herdsmen and they dwelt in tents and they went here and there and everywhere and they moved around. Well, right now, a large portion of them were dwelling close to the Amalekites. And when this war broke out, uh, Saul didn't want them to be involved in it because they were friendly. They were good. They weren't part of that nation. So he wisely asked them to move so that they wouldn't get involved. And so here we see what happened. Chapter 15, verse 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And that's a large area, by the way. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But every living thing that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. We've got a problem. We have a king now who instead of following God's very clear, exact instructions, did what he felt like doing. He partially obeyed, which means complete disobedience. He disobeyed the instructions of God. Now, you can only imagine what his motives would have been. Uh, Perhaps he spared Agag the king so he might get a ransom for him, or perhaps he might parade him through uh, the people of Israel and say, look at this king that I conquered. It may be that he fell upon the sheep, and we learn later he planned on sacrificing them to the Lord so they'd have a big celebration. But you see, it's beginning to look like it's all about Saul here. It's about him, what he decides to do, what he thinks is right. And so he failed to obey the word of the Lord. Verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now here we have an interplay between heaven and earth, between God and Samuel, and between Samuel and Saul. Samuel wanted Saul to succeed. Samuel, I think, loved Saul and wanted him to do right. And when God said that he repented that he made Saul king, it hurt Samuel at his heart because he was wanting him to succeed. He was wanting him to do right. And I believe he interceded. He prayed. And he said, Lord, please uh, spare Saul. Uh, don't be harsh with him. Give him some, uh, some uh, uh, patience. And he, he pleaded on behalf of Saul. But, but God was firm in his judgment against Saul's disobedience. And so he cried unto the Lord all night, but Samuel being Samuel, and he being the prophet of God, he knew that he had to give Saul uh, the word of the Lord. Verse 12, And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now, what is happening is Saul is lying to Samuel's face. And Samuel says, Then what are all these sheep? What are these oxen that I'm hearing there? If you perform the, well, how, how, how are they alive? And so he confronts him with that, and here's Saul now. And listen, when we're speaking truth to power, we see a pattern here. We see the lie starts here, and then the lie moves here, and then the lie moves here. The lie always has to shift as more evidence comes out. And so the first lie is we perform the will of the Lord. What about the sheep? Well, then he he modifies it, and here's what what he said. He said, and Saul, uh, uh, what meaneth the lowing of the sheep and oxen? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, For the people 
spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice uh, unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Do you understand the, the, the meaning of the word utterly? Well, we utterly destroyed them, but not utterly. We utterly destroyed the ones we utterly destroyed. You see, when, when you play fast and loose with the Word of God, you become right in your own eyes, and you become obedient to your own plan. Utter, utter destruction for all the animals and all the herds that they had was what God said. Well, we kept the best ones. The rest we utterly destroyed. Well, you don't get to play with God's Word. You don't get to rewrite it according to your liking to, to feed your ego. Okay? Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast not thou made head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? Now he's reminding him of when he was anointed king. Now you, some of you may remember the story. Uh, they were looking for Saul because he had been chosen to be the king. And they were looking, where is he? Where is he? And they found Saul hiding behind the stuff. He, he, was, he was hiding it. He, he didn't want to be seen. He didn't want to be noticed. He was meek. He was humble. Uh, he, he felt uh, odd being in the limelight. But they pulled him out. And when he came out and he stood up, behold, he was head and shoulders above everyone else. And they anointed him to be king. They, they took the oil and put it on his head and it went down on his body. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord hath sent me, and brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord in Gilgal. Now what he's saying is that, well, I, I, I did what I did. I, I, I obeyed partly, but the people, you just can't, you just can't help these people, you know. Uh, the people did this, and there they are. And, they, and it was for the good. They wanted to worship the Lord. He's trying to reason with Samuel. And here's what Samuel said. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in bird offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now he is instructing Saul in something that Saul didn't understand. God is interested in your obedience. You're king over Israel. God gives his instructions. You're supposed to follow them. It isn't about you. It isn't about having a party. It isn't about having a celebration. It is about obeying God. And God's not going to say, oh, well, they sacrificed to me, so it's okay that they disobeyed me. There's a principle here. If you're not living like God wants you to live, don't think coming to church and worshiping him is going to make it. If you're living in known sin, breaking God's laws, doing wrong, don't expect that God's going to be impressed when you come and sing His name and talk about how much you love Him when you're not obeying Him. That's true then, and it's true now. God is interested in obedience. He's interested in you following His will. Now, He's merciful, He's patient while we grow, but don't think for a moment that coming and singing a song or listening to a sermon is going to make everything all right when you're living in known sin. God expects you to repent from it. So he said that, that obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, how big a sin is your sin, Saul? How big a sin is it? Is it a little one or is it a big one? Here's what he says in verse 23 to Saul. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now Saul had gone through the land and he'd gotten rid of all the witches, all the sorcerers, all the, the necromancers, all the soothsayers. He'd gotten rid of all of them because they were wicked and ungodly. And so here is Samuel telling Saul, rebellion is like witchcraft. That's how bad it is. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Your sin is big. Your sin is bad. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now those words had to fall on the ears of Saul in a harsh 
and horrible way. It had to land on his soul like a ton of bricks. You see, because when you're anointed king, there's something that happens to you. Saul was transformed. He was turned uh, from uh, the son of a, a herding uh, shepherdman to, to a man who was now to stand head and shoulders above others, to wear the crown, to give commands, to have power, to have rule, and to be lifted that high, and then to be shot that low. Had to be a real blow to his psyche, a real blow to his ego. Thou shalt not be king anymore. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he, that is Saul, laid hold upon the the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. Now, Now, what happened here is Samuel gave the word of God, even though it hurt him in his heart to do it, and he went to walk away. And Saul reached over and tried to pull him back with his clothes, and his clothes tore. That's how violently he tried to pull Samuel back. Now, think with me. Saul is a big, strong, muscular man. Samuel, we don't know how he was built, but I know one thing. This pull, the mantle was a a serious piece of of garment. And for him to snatch him hard enough to rip his mantle had to be doing something. He's saying, I'm going to make you change your mind. I'm going to make you take that back. So he pulled him and his his clothes rent. And here's, here's what he said. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Now we know what is going to happen. Uh, Not too long from now, uh, Saul is going to anoint King David to be king. And it's going to be some time before David sits on the throne. For a time, Saul is uh, ruling uh, with madness and chaos. But eventually, David is going to replace Saul. So he's telling him in advance that God is removing the kingdom to someone else better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Now what he's saying here, you may pull my uh, mantle, you may rip my clothes, but listen, God's not somebody you can uh, change his mind. God's not someone that you can convince to go your way. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. You know what he's saying now? Let's put on a show. Let's make it look good. I've sinned. Okay, I finally admit it. Wouldn't it have been great to admit that right off the bat? He finally admits it, and he says, but let's worship anyway. Let's go through the motions. Let, let's, let's have something that they can see. I want them to see you being with me. I want them to see you worshiping with me. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Now listen, it's sad. It's sad when somebody else has to do your job. It's tragic when somebody else has to do the things that God told you to do. Samuel said, Bring me hither Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. Now in my mind's eye, I see Agag, this king, and he comes out like this. Delicately. He's kind of walking easy. He's walking with humility. He's being a diplomat now. Now before, he had no problem taking his armies and terrorizing the people of Israel. But now he is coming out delicately, and and, and notice what what happens. Uh, And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Now what he's saying is, we're not in battle anymore. This isn't anything that you want to do now. I mean, let's, let's just all be friends. And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Remember, this is Old Testament. Today, no church leader, no preacher, no teacher, no clergyman, no church organization, no denomination has the right to use force in the name of the Lord and take life in this fashion. This is a different dispensation entirely. But in this dispensation, it was not only allowable, it was sometimes their duty. And so since Saul had not performed his duty, Samuel, the prophet of God, took a sword 
either Saul's or someone else's, and finish the job. And, and when it says it hewed him in pieces, I think Samuel said, this is how you take care of those that God has condemned. And so the bloody job fell to Samuel to do. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to the house of Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. This is one of the saddest things in all of the Bible. You see, Saul had potential. He was strong. He was tall. He was muscular. He was a mighty warrior. He was brave. He had all kinds of talent, all kinds of qualities that could have been devoted to God. And here's the interesting thing we learn about Saul. Saul had the ability to have brave, good, courageous men to be loyal and, and, and to love him. David ended up being a protege of Saul and loved him and cared about him. And even when Saul tried to kill him, David would not reciprocate. He still showed him honor. He showed him respect. And he said, I will never lay my hand upon the Lord's anointed. And when Saul died in battle, years after this, and Saul and his son Jonathan died in battle, David wept. He wept hard, and he made a song of mourning and a lamentation, and he made a decree that everybody ought to learn this song and sing it out of honor for Saul and for Jonathan. And he honored him in this song, and he talked about how, how have the mighty fallen. And it grieved him that this man fell in such a way. Listen, Saul could have been good, but what was his problem? What happened? I'll tell you what happens. It happens too often with all of us. Me. Me. You know the problem that you have is the one that you see when you look in the mirror? That's the biggest problem you have. That's the biggest problem I have. Now, I've had people that have maybe done me wrong. They've said things that weren't kind or said things that weren't true. I've had people in my youth try to hurt me and bully me and things like that. But none of them have hurt me as much as I have on occasion hurt myself just by not being wise, by not listening to God, by doing something other than what God would have me do. And I did more damage to myself, and I believe the same is probably true for every one of us. The problem with Saul was not the people. It was Saul. He was supposed to lead the people. He was supposed to say how things were done. And he did it. He went along with it. Now, here's the thing about we bring it to a conclusion, we bring it to an understanding. In a way, this entire story is about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. It's about the future. It's about what's happening. Do you realize that just as certainly as God had said, I'm going to judge the Amalekites for their wickedness, God has made the same judgment about the entire human race? We are all marked for death. We are, all, we are all marked for utter destruction. And it is only the saving grace of Jesus Christ that makes the difference between eternal damnation and eternal life. It is through Him that we are saved. But we understand the politics of this, that there are times when God sends a messenger to speak truth to power, and power should listen. Power should listen. But when a nation, a ruler, turns a deaf ear to the Word of God, there is disaster waiting. So what happened? What was the result of this? Saul was no longer able to claim the blessings of God. God still was patient with Israel. He still led them. He still let them have victories. But Saul never got to enjoy a good relationship with God anymore after this. Saul never got to have a personal word from Samuel anymore about this. Saul was now kind of on his own. And it was a sad and lonely place. And Saul had psychological problems. Saul had a dark spirit that would come over him. And what would happen is he'd get in a gloom. He'd get it in a despair. Today we'd call it depression. And so he'd be sitting on his throne and he'd be all gloomy and sad and couldn't function. 
And they said, we need somebody to cheer him up. And maybe some nice music would help. And so they said, who knows how to play on a harp really good could come and play and make music for Saul to feel better. And they say, we know a fellow out there in the, in the woods, he keeps sheep, and his name's David, and he can really play. And they say, well, let's call him up here to get before Saul. So David's playing on his harp and perhaps singing the praises of the Lord, and it made Saul feel better. So they became friends. They, they had a relationship. Saul liked having David around. And David felt happy to be used of the Lord to make the king feel better. David was so loyal, so kind, so respectful towards Saul. But there came a time when Goliath showed up and he defied the armies of Israel and he demanded a champion to come and fight with him one-on-one -on -one and settle the matter. And he defied Israel. He, he blasphemed the God of Israel. And he came day after day speaking in that way. David came to bring some food to his brothers who were in the army and he heard Goliath. And he said, why hasn't anybody taken him out? And they said, you don't understand. He's, he's a giant. He's so tall. He's got this spear. He's got all this. He, he's a warrior from his birth. I mean, uh, nobody can match Goliath. And David said, well, I, I took on a bear once. I killed a lion once. If God can help me do that, I can take him out. And they said, uh, okay, go, go to the king. So the king asked him all this. And they, they well, you know the process. So Saul put his armor on David. And David couldn't walk around in Saul's armor. He essayed to go. He couldn't wear it. It was too much. It was too bulky. And so he put it off, and he said, this isn't for me. He said, I've got a sling. And so he went out there, and he got five smooth stones. You know the story. He ran toward Goliath, and he said, you come to me with a sword and a spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he, as he was running, he took that and wound that thing up and aimed it right at him, and pop, got him right here. He went down like a tree. David stood up on top of him, drew his sword, lifted it up and brought it down on Goliath's head and he tangled up his teenage fingers in that dead giant's dead head and he hoisted it up and the children of Israel went wild. They got full of courage, they got full of military zeal and they took off after the Philistines and chased him all the way back home and killed as they went and there was a great victory. But here's what happened. The women came up with a song. You see, women would get together and make tunes and make songs to celebrate some great victory or some holiday. And here's what they sang. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. Saul heard that song. And he remembered, I've taken the kingdom from you and given it to another that's better than thou. And Saul became bitter. He became jealous. He became filled with vengeful, murderous rage. And he eyed David from then on. And he noticed everything David did worked. Everything David said was true. Everything David did was blessed by God. And when he went out to battle, he had a victory. When he came back, they were singing his praises again. One day Saul was on his throne and he was having a depression fit. And David was over there playing his harp like before. See, when he wasn't captain of the military, he was still uh, Saul's chief musician. And here was Saul. He's fiddling with his javelin, looking at David. Fiddling with his javelin, looking at David. And pretty soon, whew, he threw it as fast and as hard as he could. But David, being light of foot, jumped out of the way, and it went into the wall behind him. So David left. There were two times Saul did this. After a while, you get the idea it's dangerous to be in the throne room. Maybe I need to find another place to be for a while. And it went on like that. And here's the scene. Here's the scene. Now follow me. There's a rightfully anointed king who has God's blessings and God's favor, who was a man after God's own heart, a rightfully anointed king. And then there's a madman who's actually ruling as king. Do you get it? That's where we are now. There is a rightfully anointed king, but he's not ruling here yet. He will, but not yet. Right now, the world is being run by egotistical madmen. And that's the best we're going to get until King Jesus comes. 
we have to deal with it. We have to be like David. We have to learn how to stay alive. We have to learn how to show respect while at the same time serving God and not Him. We have to learn not to be like Him while showing respect to them as much as we can. And David had to walk that tightrope all his time until God made him to be king. But what did he learn through that? He learned how to be king. He learned how to have men follow him. He learned how to be loyal and how to achieve others being loyal to him. God was preparing the nation of Israel to accept David to bring in the golden age of Israel That would be the most wonderful time that nation have ever had. But here is where we are today. We are being run by a demented power. The powers that be are not following God. They may do so partially, but not totally. And therefore, we're in trouble. Grace is what we need from God. God has said some things to power. And there are times today even though this is not a theocracy, and certainly the the President of the United States or the Supreme Court or the Congress or the Senate are, are not part of God's covenant people, and this country is not like Israel. It's not. Even so, the principle is still there that God expects those who know God and are spokesmen for God to be able and to be willing and to be faithful to speak truth to power even if it means persecution, even if it means death, we are to speak truth to power. And we're going to look at several more instances in this series where God has people speak truth to power and learn lessons from those as well. well. But here's the thing. Jesus is the king that will come. But right now, he is the king of our hearts. And we have a king who's perfect. We have a king who loves us. We have a king who is merciful and kind and good. And anyone, no matter where you came from, no matter what your background, no matter how many sins you've committed, no matter how many blasphemies you've uttered, no matter how much stubbornness you've uh, displayed, if you come to Jesus in repentance and you come to Him in faith, He will forgive, He will save, He will bring you all the way to heaven, He will give you a mansion, He will write your name in the Lamb's book of life, and you can be eternally saved. Jesus is the King of our hearts now. And while we serve King Jesus, as we see in our flag as the symbol of the Christian faith, and while we live in the United States, where this flag is a symbol of our country that we live in, it is to Jesus that we have our first obedience. It is to Jesus we have our first allegiance. And if the government ever tells us to bow to them that which we should only bow to our Savior Jesus Christ we will bow to Christ first and we will take whatever consequences come from that we may find ourselves one day as other nations have have come to where being a Bible believing Christian is going to be a disadvantage for you in this country and it's already starting to be that way and I don't think it's going to get better Uh, I think it's going to get worse I encourage you listen if you haven't been saved yet it's time for you to get saved choose your kingdom Who's going to be your ruler? Who are you going to obey? Who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to uh, uh, follow with your life? If it's not King Jesus, it's going to be whatever madman is ruling now. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to follow King Jesus in our hearts, to obey when you speak to us, Lord. May we listen. May we hear. May we follow. Lord, I pray that you forgive us for sometimes going our own way like Saul and for doing that which strokes our ego, for doing that which is popular, for doing that which makes other people love us. Lord, help us to do that which is right, what you have told us to do. May we fear you more than we fear the loss of popularity or the loss of advantages uh, or whatever the loss may be. Lord, may we realize that losing your favor and your blessing is the worst loss of all. Lord, may we follow our King. His name is Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand together.